Hello, welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Shirley Yang has done extensive research into Chinese culture and poetry. Chinese poetry gives a window into Chinese views of identity, freedom, and communal belonging. It opens up conversations between Chinese cultural themes and other ways of seeing the world. Shirley explores how ancient Chinese poetry resonates with Chinese people today and also with Christian themes. She explores why intercultural conversations are important and why we need to develop skills in respectful and vibrant intercultural conversations. Shirley, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you for having me. You've done a lot of research into Chinese poetry. When did you first get interested in such poetry? Since I was a little. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was born and brought up in uh, post Mao China. And uh, uh, when I grew up, uh, like millions of other Chinese people, um, I read and recite um, many Chinese classical poetry. And uh, <clears throat> And quickly, I swirled into the poetry fever in the 1980s, the so-called the Second Enlightenment, uh, called by the scholars. And uh, that's the time uh, it seems everybody's writing poetry and reading poetry. And I still remember, um, yeah, as a teenage girl, I was really wanting to explore the world ahead of me. And I bought and read a lot of poems written by local Chinese and Western mm. poets. And one day I strode down to the street and, and bought a po poetry book, like any other books I bought, and came home and read with such a fascination. And years later, I found out it's actually the Book of Psalms in the mm. Hebrew Bible. Mm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are familiar with Western poetry, but I think Chinese poetry would be very unfamiliar to most Westerners. Yes, yes. Uh, poetry has a long... Uh, historical, uh, religious, mm. and cultural tradition in China. Mm. Uh, one of our uh, four classics, five books, uh, is called the Book of Poetry. Oh. And that was yeah. written back in 10th to 7th century BC. And uh, one of our earliest poets, uh, Qu Yuan, mm. wrote uh, the very well-known um, quest uh, to heaven. Um, that's still being read by Chinese, and people still remember this poet. I mean, yeah, even Confucius um, read the Book of Poetry, and he, he said uh, one should not speak unless he learns poetry. Mm. So that's how important it is uh, in our history. Um, <clears throat> of course, the... Uh, forms of language change over time. And, uh, um, but uh, especially during political or social changes, uh, poetry has been used as a key form to communicate well, what people are struggling with and what the yearnings are. So uh, like during the Cultural Revolution, uh, some Chinese thinkers uh, write poetry just to express their struggle in, uh, in the face of the chaotic reality around them. Mm. So uh, it, it's been a very important form mm. of communication. And how does Chinese poetry give us a window <coughs> into uh, Chinese views on identity and freedom and things like communal belonging? I think it just, uh, just waking up from the national trauma mm. of the Cultural Revolution um, many Chinese intellectuals started to uh, reflect, have the deep reflection, and they asked the question and how, where they can reposition themselves in the mm. newly articulated uh, society. At the time, there were many um, Western philosophies, literatures being translated into Chinese, and, uh, and, and they're asking all these questions. Um, uh, who are we? Where do we belong? Um, where are we going? Where's the nation going? Mm. So all these existential questions they're asking. And, and that's the period that it's called Renaissance of Chinese in the 80s, uh, uh, that people are search, searching to free their spirit. So after the Cultural Revolution, there's this uh, a spiritual vacuum, if you like, um, and uh, longing to find out what's the meaning of life. I mm. still remember in 1980, there was a well-known article written in a, a, a well a famous uh, magazine. It's called, uh, Why the Road of Life Becoming Narrower and Narrower. 
by mm-hmm. author called Pan Xiao. And that article stirred up discussion throughout the whole country. And what's the meaning of life? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So they are searching what, who, who are we uh, as they come out from this collective uh, culture and they look at the bad fruit from from mm-hmm. the cultural revolution. And they say now, what's the individual cultures can offer us? And and they try to make sense of mm-hmm. who they are. Um, yeah, what what's this nation is all about and uh, where we are going and so mm. forth. Yeah. Who's your favorite uh, Chinese poet? Oh, I have quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, who are some of the men? What what do they write about that you really enjoy? Um, I guess uh, uh, they touches the heart of of the nation. For example, one poet, uh, Gu Chenghe, he, uh, he he wrote a, a line it's called uh, "Our Generation." The simple line is uh, it's actually two lines um, that 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 really summarize well a whole generation what they're struggling with. Mm. So it's uh, like uh, the dark nights have given me dark eyes, and yet I'm using them to search for the light. Mm. That's a very powerful line, isn't it? Mm. Yes. So in the midst of that struggle, and people still have a sense of hope. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. What do you see as some of the connections between... Chinese poetry and some of the biblical themes and stories. Oh, there are lots of connections. Uh, well, uh, for example, the idea of home, homecoming, mm. uh, uh, homeland, and those are very important uh, ideas for mm. the contemporary Chinese or from their poetic mm. voice. And, uh, and home for Chinese is a place that they can share a meal uh, mm. in, in, a, in close to home. And uh, we can see that that's very much connected with mm. the biblical themes, uh, uh, the Jewish tradition, there are lots of correlation mm. with mm. that community, hospitality mm. and relationship, family. Mm. And um, yeah, that's just one of many. I mean, there mm. could be uh, others like suffering, uh, struggles for freedom and uh, and uh, uh, like the poems I just read uh, that mm. could bring a lot of cre- like correlation with um, biblical story we know the history mm. of Israelites they struggle under the Pharaoh and uh, the Exodus story mm. and even the exile story under the Babylonian ruling um, yeah, uh, the Psalms, they say, how do I sing a new song in a foreign mm-hmm. land? Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the Chinese intellectuals wrote a song, a Chinese song, in correlation with that very uh, verse. Mm. Yeah, so um, there are other themes like identity. What does it mean to be a human? Um, yeah, mm. and the they poetic voice question about uh, all this. What does it mean to be a woman, independent? Mm. Uh, have that interdependent relationship with men. And so I think the biblical story, the creation in Mago Day, the, re, uh, the new creation in Christ, mm. lots of that, we can create a lot of dialogue. I mean, mm. community, I mentioned earlier about the collectivism and individualism. Uh, China is in this uh, stage, they struggle, even till now, they're still uh, wrestling mm. with this uh, collective culture, individual culture. What does that mean? And uh, where's our tradition? Where, where's our root? And uh, some are calling for the root, but some say, no, we embrace what's good in the West. And till now, we still see that struggle. Mm. So I think the biblical theology of the um, uh, body of Christ, uh, Trinitarian theology, can speak mm. a lot in, in that, the affirmation of uh, uh, our collectivism and uh, as well as individualism uh, mm. expressed in those uh, themes. So mm. uh, I think it's very uh, dynamic and uh, I, I see a lot of correlations. Yeah, yeah I mean, because sometimes people think about Christianity as a Western religion, but <clears throat> of course the, the biblical stories were developed, have grown out of the East. You know, so they are. They're Eastern stories birthed in Eastern culture. Mm. So it's not surprising in a way that there are 
connections between the biblical stories and Asian cultures. Mm. Um, and it's interesting the way in which uh, you're exploring how people can see connections between Chinese culture mm. and stories and the biblical stories and culture as well. Mm. Mm. It's probably the case actually that the biblical culture is closer to Asian culture than it is to Western culture. Mm. In many ways, yes. I mean, the creation, God has left this imprint. Mm. Mm. Like uh, uh, I was sharing in the conference about some Chinese characters, the simple mm. theology of home, lots mm. of characters. So we, we can see the imprint mm. of the creation story. Mm. Yeah. Well, tell us about some of those characters. I know you can't <laughs> show them on camera, but what are some of the characters and what do they show? Oh, like what I will be sharing in the conference, yeah. for example, home. Home is uh, jia in the Chinese etymology. Uh, it was, it, the construction is a, a peak sitting under a closed roof. Mm. And uh, it's often used together with another term, xiang. So jia xiang become hometown and homeland. Mm. And xiang was made up, the construction of, of that character, is made of two people sitting between a meal. Mm. And another word, a ke, mm. uh, ke is a, a, a guest. And so where pro, uh, hospitality is provided, how ke is a, a pro, hospitality is provided, is also uh, a character uh, by uh, a person sitting before meal oh. and in the dish. Yeah, yeah, wow. So it's around hospitality and connection and it's a quite a drug dynamic picture of home. Yes, yes. Mm. It's where hospitality is provided. Uh, people share the meal together. It's the collective mindset. Mm. It's the harmony, uh, mm. yin and yang, you know, harmony. Mm. And uh, the, that, that's why the highest ideal for Chinese is the, the, uh, the heaven and person becoming one. So mm. I, I think all those analogies uh, have so much uh, correlation with the biblical themes mm. and the uh, yeah, the Christian story certainly uh, can have very dynamic conversation with these uh, concepts mm. uh, and perhaps what to complement or, or have even deeper understanding of our mm. own faith. Mm. Yes. And you've done quite a bit of research on the 20th century Chinese poet as well. Can you tell us who that poet is and what are some of the themes that emerge from their work? Mm. Yeah, uh, I did the work uh, on the mm. person called Hai Zi. Um, he is a legendary poet in the history of contemporary Chinese mm. uh, poetry. And uh, um, I, I still remember uh, in the university in the 19, yeah, 89. Yeah, I still remember reading his uh, first epic mm. uh, poetry book called The Earth. Mm. And just uh, at the wake of Tiananmen Square incident. And uh, um, uh, yeah, one of my uh, uh, university uh, schoolmates came mm. to my dormitory and told me his dramatic death. What happened, mm. he, uh, uh, in his very short period of seven years, he wrote how many millions of words, essays and poetry and so on. But uh, just in 1989, he, I think it's in March, he just walked a long road on the, on the, to the gate of uh, the Great Wall and laid himself in the form of the cross and allow the train to crush his body. So it's, mm. it's his dramatic death and uh, marked the ending of the Romantic movement in the 1980s mm. and the beginning of um, the market economy in the 1990s. Mm. So um, that's a high zi, and uh, mm. his poetry expressed the basically uh, four themes as I journey mm. with him. And uh, one is the homelessness, mm. the, the, the sense of uh, a loss of land. And you see, even back in 1980s, he prophetically uh, foresaw that the loss of land, urbanization, because of urbanization, industrialization, the sense of uh, homelessness that contemporary Chinese people will experience. And we see that today, mm. um, you know, the urbanization rate has uh, uh, increased from 20% in 1980 to now 50%, mm. and it will be more in the coming years. Mm. So um, I, I think that, that that's one key theme. And mm. uh, um, there are others like uh, uh, his vision of home is to have this ideal home that uh, uh, people can sit uh, around the table, sharing, mm. you know, have the table fellowship 
uh, where meals shared, mm -hmm. hospitality is provided. And uh, also as he uh, struggled and tried to reconcile the vast differences between the East and uh, West in his poetry, he uh, uh, experienced this brokenness. He, he realized mm -hmm. it's necessary for one to be whole. And uh, lastly, it's his suicide, uh, his poetic action, his poetry action is a, is a mm -hmm. form of um, uh, final self-surrender. Yeah. to the greater Tao, if you like. Yeah. So all those four themes, I found such a correlation as I journey also through the Luke's gospel. And I, mm. I look at uh, mm. homelessness. And I mean, Jesus, mm. he bring the presence of God in those homelessness, in, 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 in those uh, dislocated places. Uh, mm. And uh, the table fellowship, who we know Jesus also offered that inclusive community mm. Uh, and he shared meals with the prostitutes, tax collectors, mm. and uh, and uh, uh, people looked down, uh, and the, that uh, Jesus includes them and embraced them. And the brokenness, mm. the same Jesus offered the way of the cross and offered his disciples to follow him in that way. And uh, the death, I mean, Jesus is through his powerlessness, and he showed he mm. has such a radical powerlessness. Uh, to embrace humanity through the cross. Mm -hmm. So I, I just found those uh, uh, correlations and common language uh, that uh, Heidze and the Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, they shared, mm -hmm. and therefore they become the starting point for mm -hmm. ongoing conversations between mm -hmm. Chinese culture uh, through this poet's voice and the Gospel through Jesus. Yeah. It reminds me of the importance of intercultural conversations, actually. Um, how do you think that we as Christians uh, in America or Australia can get better at intercultural conversations and also better at understanding Chinese culture? Okay. Um, yeah. I think the first and foremost is to listen. Mm. Yeah. Like conversation like this, mm. uh, asking the questions and listen slowly, humbly, mm. lovingly, and empathetically. Mm. Um, um, I think we preachers, pastors are so quick to talk mm. uh, and want to mm. speak out what we think the idea is. I think in any intercultural conversations, uh, we need to be a good listener, just like you know, Paul Tillich say the first duty of love is to listen. And it's not easy. It's not easy to listen humbly and uh, 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 with respect. Uh, I think that's the first thing the church leaders can learn mm. in our local congregation or when we engage with people of other faith yeah, mm. in our society. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to say to us today? I think as the majority of the world joins the global church mm. uh, in the 21st century um, mission movement, uh, they will make mistakes. Mm. Uh, but uh, hopefully they will make the same mistakes mm. as the Western missionaries. Mm. And I guess um, my hope is that they will uh, learn the art of intercultural conversations mm. uh, that um, as they engage with others, uh, engaging mm -hmm. with God, with the gospel, mm -hmm. so that uh, they can bear witness of Christ in the world. Mm. We hear a lot about the dramatic growth of the Chinese church. What's your sense about what's happening in Christianity in China today? Um, is, it, is it all good news and growth? Or are there struggles? What, what's your sense? Uh, I think it's uh, complicated. Mm. Like they say, anything you say about China could be true in one place. Oh, yeah. It's a big place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big place. Um, but uh, overall, my sense is that uh, um, the church uh, want, yearns for growth mm. uh, in different areas. But most importantly, uh, unlike the past, that they ask for biblical theological trainings. And I think most importantly, they need people to walk alongside with them, mm. like a mentorship and mm. Uh, mm. Uh, deep life transformation. Mm. Uh, some, some, uh, uh, some 
people can walk alongside with them, hold their hand, and uh, um, yeah, and allow them to be, and and perhaps uh, uh, to grow that intimacy with mm. God. I, I think that's the most deep seated uh, be, uh, belief or needs uh, right now, uh, whether it's in the local church or in the mission field. That intimacy and knowing the Father's love, knowing mm. Jesus' love. And so everything they do, you know, Chinese culture is very performance driven. We do, do, do. We like mm. to, you know, uh, but, you know, just to be and receive mm. the love of the Father and to know His love. And, uh, and, and so everything we do is overflow of that being, of mm. the recipient of God's grace. Mm. I, I think that that will be the key. It's not that people even from outside can do much, but simply walking alongside with them, but uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to move and be sensitive. And this is part of the intercultural conversation comes in as well. Mm -hmm. And to be wise, to ask Mm -hmm. the key question. The more discerning we ask the right question, the more I think the the, the fruitful, uh, effective ministry will be. It's like, um, where is God? What is he doing? Mm -hmm and uh, uh, what he's trying to show you. Um, and the, when those open-ended questions opens, the amazing God mm. who just, Holy Spirit just moved in and people encounter his love uh, in a quite an amazing way, mm. yeah. We hear a lot about the growth of the Chinese church in, in rural settings, um, but now that major cities are becoming very wealthy, people are becoming urbanized, the, the, the world is their playground. How do you think the Chinese church is adapting to a new, modern, wealthy, global environment? They are adapting. Mm. <laughs> they are. Uh, but uh, what does that mean? Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think a lot of them, uh, as you one of your interviews mm. uh, says that the silent majority, I think uh, uh, it's true. A lot of people... Uh, a lot of church leaders, they are uh, happy uh, to be in their setting, mm. but they want to learn more about, the, say, church models, uh, mm. the infrastructure. Uh, I mean, the Western church we had 2,000 years of yeah. developing the systematic theology uh, and church ecclesiology, and, mm. uh, and church is still in that transition. Uh, mm. from the rural church to the city-based and the more self church sort of a uh, type of church and mm. they in that transition they're learning about management church uh, uh, yeah policy and mission policy and all this infrastructure is mm. uh, they, they're learning that but uh, my sense is that uh, uh, spiritually uh, perhaps from the rural traditional churches they perhaps they are uh, uh, have some uh, 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 a type of spirituality, perhaps mm. uh, that's uh, more uh, pious, uh, traced back to the uh, early missionaries' influence. Uh, whereas the new city one, the, perhaps they they are more like from the student movement, uh, the work mm. of the campus work, and 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 then to the um, uh, and then now they trying to uh, manage church as well as the busy urban life and like mm. many other cities like Tokyo, Hong Kong, those Christians, they mm. are what they struggled and the same in mm. China, those city mm. leaders are struggling mm. as well. Yeah. Charlie, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. You're welcome. Thank yeah, you for having thank me. You. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.